let me ask you this, doctor. What kinds of um, forms does the medical marijuana come in? You're talking about, um, you know, a young child coming in. Do they get a tablet, a capsule? Are people still smoking? Uh, what, what forms do we take this in? Yes, great. So great question, Tracy, about the forms, and this is a really important thing. So, uh, so first of all, I would say this: in Pennsylvania, actually smoking the marijuana is illegal, right? So there's, and what we mean by that is actually taking fire and lighting it to the plant, the process of combustion. But what what you're allowed to do is actually vaporize. So, so the, the easiest way to explain this to the patients is I like to explain that the medical marijuana comes in basically three different forms that can be administered. So the first form would be something that would be inhaled, and these would be preparations that are vaporized, okay? The second form would be preparations that are taken orally by mouth, and these would be things like a capsule or an oil or a tincture. The third form of medical marijuana is a topical preparation. So these would be things like a cream or a gel or a lotion. And each of these different forms, Tracy, has different uh, physiological properties. So, for example, when you used inhaled cannabis, we, it works very quickly. You feel the effects of it within a minute to two minutes after it's consumed or inhaled, but then it only lasts for, say, an hour to two hours. Versus when you look at taking marijuana by mouth orally, it has what we call a delayed onset meaning it could take an hour to an hour and a half really to, to, to kick in or take effect. But then on the backside, it lasts much longer, six to eight hours. So depending on the actual route of administration, we can that, that can sort of dictate our therapy. So for example, somebody um, that we were treating for seizures or maybe for autism, we might want to have more of a steady state in their blood. So an oral preparation really might be um, the way to go versus maybe somebody with MS, they were really trying to treat their their spasm, maybe a vaporized form to use as needed would be more appropriate. So depending on the form of medical marijuana can be depending on what the goals of treatment are, if that makes sense. Folks, if you're listening and, and you have a question for the doctor, you're more than welcome to be, give us a call. I mean, it's a free call, and, and you can ask the question right on the air, or you can always ask Pat, and then we can relay that to the doctor. But it's 283-2525 is our number, 283-2525. And actually, we're only here for another 10 minutes for Let's Talk on this subject today. Let me ask you this, kind of piggybacking on, on your statement there, doctor, when you're talking about the forms of intake, if you will, and then the different conditions that people are 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 challenged with. When you say autism, I'm, I automatically think of ADHD. Is ADHD under the, the 21 qualifications for medical marijuana? So currently, ADD and ADHD are not listed as, as individual entities to be certified for medical marijuana, and autism is looked at at its, at its own entity. Okay. I, think, I think one of the things, Tracy, you know, it's interesting, you, when you go from different state to state, there are different qualifying conditions, right? So you might go and say uh, a state, let's just pick, you know, Illinois, for example, and maybe they have traumatic brain injury as a qualifying condition, but we don't have that in Pennsylvania. If, for example, if you go into the District of Columbia, it's up to the physician's discretion if medical marijuana could be helpful for that condition. Okay. Right? So, so and, and, and we're constantly giving feedback to the state and the Department of Health and the advisory board about adding new conditions down the road. Okay. And so hopefully, yes. So what I wanted to ask you then is, because I know people who have ADHD and how they take the medications. And yes. so my question then to piggyback on, off your point that you made just a moment ago, if you have a, a condition that you have to have the medication at a, at a regular interval, whether it's once a day, twice a day, you know, whatever it would be for that particular individual, do you have to to use the medical marijuana in the same regimen that you do the medication that you're on right now. Yeah, so I think it would. It, it all depends, you know, uh, Tracy, on the actual the, the, the condition, what you're trying to treat, as well as the as the other medications, right? So um, for things, for example, again, I'll go back to the seizure example. For something like seizures, really, what you're going for is a is a steady state in the blood or in the plasma. You want to keep that level as consistent as you can. So in something like that, I think it would be much more important to to administer the cannabis um, medically on a on a more regimented base uh, basis. 
right? Whereas I think sometimes we'll, we'll take another example, say for PTSD, where maybe maybe the symptoms more involve um, uh, difficulty sleeping or, or panic attacks or anxiety attacks, whereas the cannabis could be used much more on an as-needed type basis in those situations. And I was wondering if you could expound on the uh, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Someone just called in and asked our producer to ask you about that, how it will help. Can you explain a little bit more about that? Uh, absolutely. And, and without getting really super into details and in, in biochemistry and organic chemistry, um, I think really the way I explain it to, to my patients is, is it, it can help. Cannabis can really, in PTSD patients, it can help sort of quiet the mind or bring things back to, to what I call the center or to the middle, right? And so oftentimes what you will see in patients with PTSD, what they will explain is that when that, that, that their mind is, is, is consistently sort of going at 100 miles an hour and it's hard for them to to often quiet their thoughts um, or to control those thoughts and typically what cannabis can do is help to sort of uh, um, slow that down to quiet the mind and help really sort of make that thought process more I would say delineated than anything else um, I think when you get down into the science of it how does it work but you know it, it really acts uh, um, uh, cannabinoids are neurotransmitters just like anything else like serotonin or dopamine or norepinephrine and we we know that, that, that cannabinoids play a role with those neurochemical communication systems as well. So um, we believe that, that that's really sort of the, the physiological or, or chemical reason that the cannabis is helping with PTSD. Doctor, I'm sorry we only have five minutes left when I'm going to ask you this question because it could be a show in and of itself. But, of course, Dr. Brian Donner with us, Compassionate Certification Centers. What, what role does medical marijuana play in someone who is facing drug addiction, especially with the opioids that we continue to hear about. I keep hearing that the, that medical marijuana can help, but I'm not exactly sure how. Yeah, and uh, this is a great question, and it's been something that's brought up very, very frequently. And I, I can tell you this, I, you know, I've, I'm board certified as an emergency physician, and, and, and obviously the opiate epidemic, I've been up close and, and personal with it. Um, and I think one of the things that, that, that we've seen is there really hasn't been a, a legitimate solution or answer to this yet. And a lot of the data has shown already that, that, that uh, uh, cannabis can absolutely help uh, uh, resolve the issues with opiates. Uh, when you look at, there was a study in 2014 uh, published by the American Medical Association, as a matter of fact, that showed that states that had a uh, medical marijuana program had a uh, approximately 25% lower opiate-related mortality rate compared to states that did not have a medical marijuana program. So what that means is that 25% that less people were dying from opiates in states with, with medical marijuana programs. Um, I think when you look at how can medical marijuana help treat opiate addiction, it's, it's sort of a few things. I think, number one, many of the people who are on opiates were placed on them for chronic pain, right, or pain issues. When you look at what cannabis can do, we know that it can be very very effective in treating chronic pain. The other thing that cannabis can really do is we know that it can help reduce the symptoms of acute opiate withdrawal, the anxiety, the nausea, vomiting, uh, abdominal cramping, diarrhea. We know cannabis can lessen those symptoms so it can make it um, uh, um, uh, less difficult to deal with the opiate withdrawal. So I think those are just a few of the ways that, 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 that cannabis can help with the opiates. I think we're really exploring the, 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 the psychiatric aspect of that in more depth right now. Now. Folks, if you're listening, we only have about four minutes left with the doctor. If you'd like to call and ask a question about the cards for medical marijuana, the products that are out there, how it affects the body, you're feel, feel free and do that. We probably, uh, we probably have time for maybe one call. I'm looking at Pat. I think so. Okay, so 724-283-2525, 283-2525, and it would be a free call. You can do this anonymously. We can put you on the air. We don't have to ask your name if you'd like to go ahead and ask your question. Let me ask you, though, doctor, back to obtaining the cards. Do we have to renew the cards every year, every five years, or once we have the cards, they are good for our lifetime? 
Yeah, so another great question, Tracy, and with regard to renewing the card, so the, the state has put a limit. The maximum of time that, uh, that we're allowed to certify a patient for is, is one year. So patients will need to have their card renewed on a, on a yearly basis, right? Now, I would, I would sort of put a little a caution with that, that that's the current regulations as we stand today. At some point, those could obviously change. But right now, patients need to get their card renewed um, once a year. In addition, the other important thing that patients know is that you do not need a referral to to see some but to see a physician to get your medical marijuana um, uh, card. So patients are able to go see a physician such as myself or anybody else without a referral from their PCP or their specialist. We may have a question coming over, so let me ask you this while we uh, grab this question, and we're almost out of time. But any research initiatives in, in in Pennsylvania, at least, is there anything on the horizon that you see coming down the road that's exciting in this field? Absolutely. I think research is the biggest thing, and, I, and Pennsylvania has done a very good job of that. So quickly, Pennsylvania has been one of the states that actually put medical marijuana research into the state regulations and medical marijuana programs. So you're, you're going to see uh, clinical research starting to be done at a very high level at the highest uh, you know, academic institutions, um, Temple, Pitt, uh, uh, Penn, places like that, sort of across the state. So yes, that's happening, and it's happening aggressively. Um, I think what you're also starting to see is some research happening in the private sector, and particularly from the, the CBD standpoint. So I can tell you, for example, you know, we're, we're going to be starting a research trial um, with hemp-derived CBD uh, looking to treat um, uh, irritable bowel syndrome here just after the first of the year. So there's really, um, there's, there's a whole bunch of research on the horizon and in, in, in so many different uh, areas um, that I, it'd probably be impossible for me to pick one, you know. Doctor, two minutes left. The question was yeah. just handed to me. Someone wants to know if medical marijuana or any of the products at dispensaries uh, or any products that you could talk about uh, affect menopause. Yeah, it, it, that, that's a great question. So I think anything, any type of medication that, that you take um, or any type of chemical that you put into your body that acts as what we would call a neurotransmitter, so i.e. it involves a chemical means of, of communication within the brain or the, or the neurological system, I think downstream those can potentially have effects on things such as hormonal levels um, and negative feedback loops. So I think it's something that the potential is there. I can tell you this off the top of my head. I'm not personally familiar with any research uh, on, on cannabis and specifically um, um, uh, menopause. I can tell you this. We have absolutely seen effective treatments for people with, with chronic conditions such as endometriosis, um, even people, uh, even female um, uh, patients who have uh, um, very painful or difficult um, uh, ovulatory type cycles uh, um, or menstrual cycles. We've seen cannabis been able to reduce some of the negative symptoms associated with those. I could keep you for a long time, but I know we're out of time at this point. But what would you like us to do for your final thoughts as we're listening to you? Do you want us to do more research? Do you want us to see our doctors? What, what would you like us to do? Absolutely. I want us all to become more educated on medical cannabis, and I want us to spread the word to others because this is really a treatment out there that can help so many people, uh, and, and until we really remove the stigma, it's not going to be uh, as effective as we want. So I want everybody to get educated, learn, 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 and spread the word as soon as you learn something new. Of course, the doctor is with Compassionate Certification Centers. He's the CMO and co-founder. Doctor, thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate your time today. Thank you, Tracy. I appreciate it. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. And folks, again, this is our, our podcast of the day. If you would like to listen to this again, you go online to WISR 680 AM. Uh, of course, put .com at the end of that, and uh, you'll get our, our website where you can go get the podcast under Let's Talk. I'm Tracy Morgan with Let's Talk. The information and opinions shared on this program are solely those of our guests and do not necessarily represent those of WISR, the Butler County Radio Network, or its staff and employees.